All right, class, this is the lecture on skeletal muscle. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different things. This is probably going to be one of our uh, longer lectures. I'm sure you can see that by uh, uh, the time at the end of this. But the main aspects that I want us to cover are uh, structure, so structure of skeletal muscle, um, how we contract, so the uh, uh, Slide and filament theory is basically what we're going to be going over. Um, then we'll talk about fatigue, different muscle fiber types, so all the way from slow to fast, and the two different variants of fast. Um, some muscle actions, so uh, effectively like concentric, uh, isometric, eccentric movements. Um, force regulation, how, how do we even regulate force? And then Adaptation, and at the tail end of this, probably around slide 100 or so, um, we're going to be talking about um, how a muscle adapts to uh, endurance training uh, along with um, strength training and some of the differences along there. So let's go and uh, just get on going with this. So first off, skeletal muscle. Um, this is one, uh, possibly one of the biggest organ uh, 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 organ systems in our uh, body, it typically accounts for around 40 to 50 percent of an individual's total body weight. Now that that is talking about hydrated muscle. If you dehydrate muscle, it weighs significantly less. Um, but we have around 600 or so. Um, uh, I'm not going to make you count all of them in here. I'm sure you've had to do that in other classes, learning origins and insertions and things. Uh, not not in my class though. Um, and the general functions of skeletal muscle are force uh, production and heat production. So typically force production for locomotion and breathing, and that's you know talking about uh, walking, just moving uh, your arms, um, anything in any uh, capacity, breathing, the diaphragm, all of those. Uh, force production for postural support, so a lot of isometric contractions right there in, in your uh, lower back, transversus abdominis, um, and uh, uh, just uh, things of that nature. Uh, also heat production, so uh, shivering. Uh, as many of us know here in Wisconsin that um, uh, we do shiver uh, whenever it gets pretty cold outside, and the uh, skeletal muscle is doing that. That's, um, that's what's happening right there. And if you remember back to uh, bioenergetics, that we're only around 33% efficient with um, all of the energy that we break down. The rest is lost as heat. That's, so that's basically what's happening uh, going on there. Um, generally, here are these two terms uh, for muscle actions, so flexion, typically just means a reduction in a joint angle and extension uh, refers to uh, like an increase in a joint angle. So uh, things getting uh, closer to zero would be uh, flexors. Things getting closer to uh, 180, a straight line, would be extensors. And granted, some things can go beyond 180, but uh, I'm not gonna talk about that too much. Now, for skeletal muscle properties, here are four properties that I want you to be fairly aware of. And um, uh, go ahead and read the descriptions uh, uh, below these. I'm just gonna read the highlighted parts. So contractility is um, the ability for muscle cells to forcefully shorten. So that, that whole idea is the idea of actin-myosin coming, uh, coming together and shortening, uh, getting closer to uh, that age zone, that midline. Um, uh, we'll, I'll show you where all of that is if, that's, if those are foreign concepts. Um, excitability, uh, this is the ability to respond to a stimulus, so delivered by a motor neuron or a hormone or uh, something like that. Extensibility, uh, this is the ability of a muscle to be stretched, so muscles are relatively uh, pliable. Um, uh, it's, uh, this also sometimes, I, I hear this very infrequently, spasticity, um, but uh, effectively that you can extend a muscle, uh, like pull it apart a little bit, and then uh, it, it, it can effectively just move. Like uh, bones are much less extensible than muscles are. Um, and, you know, like spongy bone is a little bit more than uh, cortical bone. Uh, just some... Uh, 
uh, rather far off examples, I guess. Uh, elasticity, and this, this last one, as long as you don't tear it, um, is the ability to recoil or bounce back to the muscle's original length. So those four things, these are um, uh, interesting properties of skeletal muscle, contractility, excitability, uh, extensibility, and elasticity. So uh, C, E cubed, is typically how I like to think about it. Now, uh, whenever we start looking at uh, skeletal muscle, there's a couple of terms that we need to know. Um, so, epiperi endo, uh, myceum. Uh, now, these are respectively uh, most outside, a little bit more internal, and then endo, like nearest to the muscle fiber, the myofibrils. Um, we also have a basement membrane, which is uh, just below the endomyceum. Uh, not too much I care for you to know about this, but uh, here's one term, um, sarcolemma, that I've been using uh, quite a bit in lectures in the past. And just to, uh, in, in case you've been lost whenever I've been saying that, all that that means is muscle cell membrane. So the membrane surrounding it, you know, uh, that phospholipid bilayer. Uh, now here, uh, effectively, is just somewhat of an organization of uh, skeletal muscle. So if we're just looking at this, let's try to uh, get an appreciation for really how much is going on with all of this. So uh, here, obviously, we have a bone, a tendon, you know, tendons and uh, attach muscles to bones, right? I, I think everyone understands this. We have arteries and veins, which are taking nutrients uh, to from muscles and taking waste products away from muscles. We have this epimyceum, then this uh, perimyceum, uh, effectively surrounding all sorts of these. Then we have a, a fascicle, and then that uh, subdivides even lower. And then we have an endomyceum, and then we have individual muscle fibers. And then within uh, the individual muscle fibers, we've got myofibrils and the sarcoplasm, the sarcolemma, and satellite cells, which if you don't know what satellite cells are, uh, we're going to talk about that here in a little bit, especially in regard to exercise adaptation. Um, so uh, just basically getting an appreciation for really how complex, like if you look down at your bicep, I mean, it looks like a fairly simple, uh, I don't know, tool, I guess, um, but it's actually a, an absurdly complex uh, structure. Um, so satellite cells, um, uh, well, what I was talking about just a second ago, these play a major role in growth and repair. Um, so uh, whenever we are growing our skeletal muscle, um, we will frequently incorporate satellite cells into uh, the muscle because uh, one, one particular interesting thing about skeletal muscle versus other uh, muscle types or uh, really other cell types is that skeletal muscle is multinucleinated, meaning that there's more than one nucleus within it. So we have this idea called the myonuclear domain. And effectively, a nucleus in a certain area of a skeletal muscle, because you know skeletal muscles can be, uh, like a, one particular cell can be relatively large and wide. So one nucleus will uh, effectively be in charge, you know, for uh, lack of a better term, and to anthropomorphize it a little bit, will be in charge of a particular region of the muscle. Uh, so it effectively supports um, the uh, gene expression and transcription for that particular area of the muscle. And as muscles grow, um, a certain nucleus can only be in charge of a certain amount of area. So we have to incorporate new uh, um, nuclei into the muscle to supply genetic information to these new aspects, uh, or to the new regions of the muscle, effectively. So that's uh, really just the myonuclear domain theory uh, right there, that um, a particular nucleus is in charge of a certain area, and then as we have a muscle grow, we actually get new nuclei from 
uh, satellite cells, which are essentially just lodged in the sarcolemma, um, uh, waiting to be triggered. Now, here's a fairly interesting thing. Um, if anybody uh, has ever heard of, what's it called? Muscle memory. Muscle memory. Gosh, I can't believe I barely didn't remember that. Um, muscle memory actually is a thing, but it's not really what you think. So a, a, a lot of people uh, will talk about muscle memory in regard to um, you never forget how to ride a bike uh, or whatever. But what it actually is, is this. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, put my cursor on here and try to explain it. So uh, you have an untrained skeletal muscle, right? Then you train it a lot. Then it incorporates new nuclei within it. So this, that, it's, uh, th these are uh, satellite cells, which are now becoming new myonuclei. And then hypertrophy will ensue after that, right? So we effectively have larger skeletal muscle, and we have more nuclei in it. Now, whenever you stop training or stop having the stimulus to have a larger, stronger muscle, you will detrain. You're going to lose the size of the muscle. However, you do not lose the myonuclei. So whenever you start training again, you actually have more nuclei than you began with. So you have effectively a much larger um, uh, transcriptional capacity, so you know, making mRNAs, right? So that whenever you start training again, you can effectively get back everything that you used to have in a much more abbreviated or uh, a much more abbreviated timeline or more quickly. That's actually what muscle memory is. So uh, for all of uh, you younger people, um, uh, this is typically one of uh, my recommendations because, you know, like I'm starting to get a little bit older. Uh, just, hey, try to get your muscles as large as you possibly can right now because uh, satellite cell incorporation is much easier whenever you're younger and uh, the more satellite cells you can have in your muscles, the easier it is to, like, if you ever have, like, a layoff to where you can't uh, exercise or whatever, it'll be much easier to um, uh, get back into the swing of things. Now, uh, this is a little bit related um, to uh, the satellite cells, but now I'm going to talk just a little bit about ribosomes. Um, and both of these are in regard to uh, hypertrophy. Um, so whenever we begin training, we get incorporation of more uh, myonuclei from satellite cells. So that upregulates our transcriptional capacity, meaning making of mRNAs, right, messenger RNAs. But we also need to increase our translational capacity, so effectively getting more ribosomes. So ribosomes being the organelle that makes proteins, right? So we need to understand that that aspect gets upregulated in two different steps. So the first step, and uh, here this is this is synergist ablation, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on. But uh, the things that I want you to know are whenever you start gaining muscle mass, we have an increase in translational efficiency, which what that means is that the ribosomes that you have start having a higher output of proteins. So like a given amount of ribosomes make more protein. But then later stages in uh, like training after you've been like lifting weights or doing whatever for a longer period of time, then we have an increase in what's called translational capacity. So what that is, is just having more ribosomes. So what I'm meaning here is whenever we start exercising and actually gaining muscle mass, our ribosomes get more efficient. Then later on, if we persist with the stimulus, we get more ribosomes overall. And this is called ribosome biogenesis. So kind of like mitochondrial biogenesis that we were talking about with uh, AMPK, um, um, uh, PGC1-alpha, and so forth. Now we, here we have an increase in the quantity of this particular organelle. So um, 
that's that's effectively what's going on on a more like organelle like I don't know uh, uh, not quite molecular level whenever we're um, uh, gaining muscle mass. Now, uh, just one thing that I want y'all to be aware of: a lot of the times, whenever we study how uh, muscle grows, which, um, it, like in a laboratory like a rodent model, we do something called synergist ablation. So uh, most of the time there is a utilization of um, uh, rat or mouse calf muscles, so the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the plantaris. And in order to ensure overloading meaning like more tension on one of the particular um, uh, muscles, what uh, scientists will do is actually cut the tendon of uh, certain ones of these so that there's a heavier load on the other synergists, right? So we have agonists, antagonists, synergists, you know, muscles that essentially help each other. So a lot of times researchers will cut off the gastrocnemius and leave the plantaris and soleus to bear more load and they essentially always gain size. And just something if you're going on from here, um, in laboratory models, how we typically look at different adaptations of fast and slow twitch muscle fiber is that uh, within a rodent, the plantaris is a very fast twitch muscle the soleus is a very slow twitch muscle, and the gastrocnemius is more or less mixed. Um, so whenever uh, researchers are looking at uh, those different muscles, that's, that's kind of what they're looking at, just, you know, uh, for your information. Um, uh, all right, now let's move on uh, just a little bit um, to more of like the microstructure and, well, like what I mean by myofibrils and things like that. So myofibril, uh, effectively all that that is, um, it just, it contains the contractile proteins, you know, actin, the thin filament, myosin, the thick filament, hopefully you've heard those terms before. Uh, sarcomere, big thing with this, this is Z-line to Z-line, and uh, it is almost always called the functional unit of a muscle fiber, meaning that uh, this sarcomere is effectively is what's contracting, and there's different aspects to it. There's uh, uh, Z-lines on the end, and um, uh, there's like an M-line, an H-zone, an A-band, an I-band. And, you know, like an A-band has like a lot of myosin, uh, I-band uh, mostly um, uh, actin. Um, and one thing whenever I was talking about uh, lactic acid and what actually causes um, uh, uh, like muscle soreness, it's almost always proteins within the Z lines that are actually torn apart. Uh, and th that's really where the majority of disruption happens. Like actin and myosin almost never really accrue much damage through uh, muscle contractions and higher force outputs and things. Um, but uh, that's, uh, well, that overall is called Z-line streaming. Um, if you ever read any uh, papers or books uh, with those terms, and I just want you to be aware. Um, next thing, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Probably the biggest deal about the sarcoplasmic reticulum is that it is the storage site for calcium. And uh, calcium is extremely important in terms of muscle contraction. We have to depolarize the sarcoplasmic reticulum that will release calcium, and then that's gonna bind to some other things like troponin, and um, uh, hopefully you've heard this stuff before in other classes. Um, then we have the T-tubules, or transverse tubules, um, most of the time just referred to as T-tubules. These extend from the sarcolemma, uh, the uh, cell membrane of the skeletal muscle, to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, just kind of meaning that they uh, send forth that depolarization signal. Um, so here, just looking at this, the microstructure going on here, um, uh, probably is some of the biggest things, like here's a myofibril, it's effectively just bunches and bunches of sarcomeres. A single sarcomere, the functional unit, it's Z-line to Z-line. We've got uh, this H-zone, which is effectively here in the middle. We have an M-line, which is the median line right there. 
Um, we've got uh, this I band, which effectively is just mostly actin and, uh, well, and Z-line proteins and things. Um, uh, this A band, it's really before the I band begins, you know, a lot of myosin in there. That's why it's a little bit darker. Um, so hopefully this, this is making some sense, myosin thick actin thin filaments, uh, not, not too, too much that I'm worried about us uh, going through here. Um, <clears throat> uh, now here, uh, a couple more things, like here we've got our Z lines or our Z discs, you know, meaning the um, uh, basically end of a sarcomere. We have mitochondria that are placed within all of these myofibrils or around all of them uh, to supply them with energy. Uh, we also have these uh, T-tubules going on here, uh, shown in effectively lavender purple colors. Now, like in your body, they're uh, not that color, but uh, I, it would be kind of cool if they were, I guess. Um, and we have these uh, terminal cisternae and uh, uh, sarcoplasm, sarcolemma. We have all sorts of these things. I'm, uh, for testing purposes, uh, outside of just knowing generally what are within these, I'm not going to have you label them uh, too much. That's not um, really a goal of this class. Uh, uh, next, moving on uh, just a little bit with neuromuscular junctions, like where we actually get a stimulus from, and, you know, from an alpha motor neuron, right, and what's being propagated. So uh, really just the word neuromuscular junction, all that that means is the um, uh, point where like an alpha motor neuron with like a motor end plate is meeting a skeletal muscle to be able to innervate it. And again, motor unit, I've said this a couple of times, that's just a motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. So keep that in your noggin. Um, we have a neuromuscular cleft which is really just a short gap between a neuron and the skeletal uh, muscle fiber. And in this case, our uh, neurotransmitter is acetylcholine ACH, how, uh, like how that looks, big A, little c, little h. Um, uh, that's released from the motor neuron, and that causes an end plate potential, EPP, which effectively just means depolarization of the muscle fiber. So this goes more or less in line with what we were talking about before. Um, here is a fairly interesting way to look at all of this, like motor uh, nerve fibers, uh, neuromuscular junction, muscle fibers. This is what it actually looks like, uh, 100 micrometers, really cool stuff. But uh, here, this is effectively what's going on. Like, um, uh, there. There is a fair bit more that we could be talking about, but here just acetylcholine coming across here, depolarization, there's acetylcholine recept uh, receptors, then that's effectively going to, you know, um, uh, be depolarizing different things and the T-tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum are gonna be very implicated in what's happening next. Um, so uh, moving on from there. Um, now with, Skeletal muscle contraction, we're going to be talking about excitation contraction coupling, um, and there is quite a bit for us to know here, and if you're going to spend a lot of time studying, I would spend a lot of time on this because I'm going to be asking a lot of questions about this. Uh, well, and also, if you don't know how, to muscle, how a muscle contracts, I mean, you know, come on, like that's, uh, that's one of the biggest points in this class. Um, so the sliding filament model or sliding filament theory, uh, sometimes it's called the swinging lever arm model. Um, uh, truthfully, I almost never see it notated as that. Uh, there are a couple of other theories. There's this um, stress strain model, um, and there's this uh, electronegative model. So truthfully, um, the sliding filament model, uh, it's probably not 100% right. I would not bet my life on it being correct, but it is functionally the best understanding that we currently have, and this could change at some point. Um, uh, truthfully, whenever I learned about the electronegative model um, uh, from Dr. Dave Pascoe, uh, I, I really loved it, but, um, uh, but this model is uh, the one that we should really focus on uh, the most. 
Um, so effectively what's going on, uh, so muscle shortening occurs due to the movement of the actin filament over the myosin filament. And there's a formation of cross bridges, you know, actin myosin binding sites, and then we're going to uh, break apart an ATP in a particular way, and then that is going to cause a power stroke, meaning that like the myosin head, there's like an S1 and S2 aspect to it, and that's going to essentially cock in a way and move the actin more towards the midline of the, uh, 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 of the sarcomere, and effectively what's happening is there's a reduction in the distance between the z-lines and it really it just gets compressed um, a little bit so uh, effectively this is what's happening here so we've got a sarcomere this a band um, uh, uh, well really the a band um, probably won't change much but this middle part will and uh, this i band um, that will certainly get reduced in terms of size, but the main things that I want you to know are these Z lines get closer together through contraction. Um, <clears throat> now here, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about a couple of new proteins. Um, so there's troponin, and there's actually three different flavors of troponin. So there's a troponin uh, uh, T, C, and I. Uh, really, the main one that we're going to be uh, concerned with is troponin C, which that means that calcium is going to bind to it. Now, all of the other ones being uh, regulatory in some way, I don't care if you really worry about them uh, too much because that's, uh, that's a little bit deeper than I care for you to know. But what's happening here is troponin, uh, tropomyosin, and actin are all together in this thin filament and the thick filament is effectively just myosin. So uh, we have to have some type of binding between this actin and myosin. Now what's going on there, uh, like we'll get just a little bit more into, effectively what it's going to be is troponin, uh, calcium binding to it, and then that's going to pull tropomyosin uh, uh, away from the actin myosin binding site so that myosin can actually bind to actin. So really in the initial stages of uh, um, contraction there's a lot more busyness going on with the thin filament and less going on with the thick filament and then the actual moving is caused by the thick filament. Um, <coughs> So uh, here, let's go through just a little bit energy for muscle contraction. Uh, so we talked about uh, bioenergetics and um, uh, exercise metabolism uh, quite a bit. And this is really um, where the rubber meets the road to, you know, use a cliche term. Uh, but ATP is required for muscle uh, contraction. We actually can't get the myosin uh, to move or the power stroke to happen without the breakdown of ATP. And it is done by an enzyme called myosin ATPase. I would know that. And that enzyme uh, will um, uh, break down ATP and then uh, we will have an ADP and an inorganic phosphate. And then there's different aspects in there that uh, actually cause the power stroke. Um, but something uh, interesting that I want to hit you with right now, this myosin ATPase. There's not just one flavor of that enzyme. There's a slower variant and a faster variant. And for those of you that uh, find this interesting, um, uh, that is partially how we fiber type skeletal muscle, is what type of myosin ATPase is present within the muscle. So the um, uh, faster myosin ATPase has slightly faster enzymatic activity, and the slower one has slightly slower enzymatic activity. So uh, there we go there. Um, now the sources for ATP for muscle contraction, these um, uh, should be very well known to everyone in here. Uh, phosphocreatine, uh, glycolysis, and oxidative phosphorylation. Um, so effectively where all of this is going on, um, 
we get uh, from the blood, we get glucose, fatty acids, all amino acids, all sorts of things going on in here. And um, uh, keep in mind, we've got muscle glycogen, blood glucose. We have intramuscular fatty acids. We have circulating fatty acids. We also have proteins uh, or amino acids. Um, uh, like the um, uh, branch chain amino acids, we can actually get those from the bloodstream or from inside of the muscle. So all sorts of places that we can get all of this from. So uh, phosphocreatine, glycolysis, um, oxidative phosphorylation, all of that is feeding this cycle of generating more ATP. Now, uh, something here for contraction, contraction, we are going to be using ATP for this myosin ATPase, which yields contraction. Now, something you might not know, the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, is actually fairly active whenever we're relaxing. It's um, uh, to get calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum is actually an energy dependent process. It's from an enzyme called CIRCA, uh, S E. RCA or uh, sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum ATPase and uh, that consumes uh, quite a bit of ATP so whenever we're contracting myosin ATPase is very active whenever we're relaxing this circa is very active and I'm going to show you some other pictures of that uh, going forward um, but uh, before we get into that let's go step by step in excitation uh, contraction uh, coupling. All right, so here about half an hour in uh, to the lecture, this is probably gonna be a point that you're gonna wanna come back and review numerous times. So uh, starting with excitation contraction coupling, all that this means is excitation, that's really more on the neural end, contraction, that's more on the muscular end, just in case that, that doesn't really make much sense. Um, so here is a uh, fairly in-depth step-by-step process that, you know, we'll probably go over a few times. Um, so depolarization of the motor end plate, so from the alpha motor neuron, you know, sending acetylcholine across, that's the exci excitation part, um, that being coupled to muscle contraction. Then an action potential, you know, uh, uh, depolarization more or less, so a lot of sodium flooding inside, you know, altering the charge. That goes into the T-tubule, and that will cause the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the T-tubule gets depolarized first, then the SR, uh, or sarcoplasmic reticulum, will get depolarized next. Now that um, calcium and CA2+, so double charge, that's going to uh, be important in terms of fatigue later. That binds to the C uh, troponin, so um, the different flavors of troponin uh, aren't abundantly important uh, to me in this class. This causes a change, conformational change or an alteration in the shape of tropomyosin. Effectively, it pulls tropomyosin away from the uh, active binding site, the actin myosin binding site. And then there's going to be a, what's termed a strong binding state form uh, formed uh, between actin and myosin. And then contraction occur, uh, occurs after that. Um, so in a way, this is kind of what's going on. Uh, so the sarcolemma is depolarized. It's going to travel down into uh, the T-tubules. Uh, and then there's going to be an alteration, something called uh, DHP, uh, dihydropyridine. I, I don't think I'm saying that right, but it's, it's close enough. You don't need to know that, uh, but a DHP receptor. Um, and then what's actually going to end up releasing the calcium is called a uh, ryanidine receptor. Um, so there's these different flavors of receptors that are uh, going on through all of this. So uh, just going back a little bit, the sarcolemma is going to be depolarized in the T-tubule, and then effectively the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to get depolarized and release the calcium to bind to troponin C. And then that's going to alter this uh, TM tropomyosin so that myosin and actin in this little green spots can actually bind to each other. 
Now that's whenever contraction is happening, um, and the myosin ATPase, uh, some somewhere on this uh, myosin head, that's going to be breaking down ATP. And for relaxation, uh, this circa here, that's going to be uh, breaking down ATP to get calcium back into the SR. Um, and uh, calcium, while it's within the SR, is actually bound to something called calcisequestrin. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. I just, uh, uh, truthfully, I a lot of times I say these words just in case you ever hear them again uh, from someone else. I don't want it to be the first time. Um, so already talked about that. Okay, so step by step, excitation, contraction coupling. So first off, let's look at these three steps of excitation, then we'll move on into uh, the contraction aspect of it. So a nerve signal arrives at the synaptic knob, and then uh, from there, uh, so really just the, the, the synapse, like that, that like motor end plate, like where that is like being buried into the skeletal muscle, like knowing that synaptic knob, that, that's not super important, but uh, there's a nerve signal or an action potential being propagated down a particular axon of a motor, uh, an alpha motor neuron, and then acetylcholine, ACH, you know, that neurotransmitter, um, uh, the, the same one that, you know, is like the parasympathetic one, like uh, this is the only neurotransmitter that we care about in regard to skeletal muscle, right? Um, it's released and it binds to uh, receptors on the motor end plate and that opens ion channels so that sodium can enter the muscle fiber, you know, causing depolarization, getting it a lot more positive, right? So then we have a propagation of the signal and then the sodium influx um, causes depolarization and it's conducted down the T tubules. So uh, sarcolemma, then T tubules, that's what's going on here. Now the contraction aspect to this, <coughs> the depolarization of the T tubules causes the release um, of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? And then calcium binds to troponin, causing a shift or a movement in tropomyosin to un uncover uh, or unveil, I don't know, like however you want to say this, um, uh, the myosin actin binding site, where they're actually going to bind. Then myosin binds to actin, and this forms what is called a cross bridge. And then, uh, like ATP, it's already in the myosin, uh, like cleft, um, uh, really once the inorganic phosphate from it is released, and I'm going to show you some pictures of this moving on, hopefully this is going to make some sense. Um, release from myosin and the cross bridge movement occurs. Then, you know, we because frequently we have numerous contractions in a row, um, a new ATP attaches uh, and that breaks the cross bridge, then the ATP is broken down to, you know, it's um, uh, constituent parts, ADP and inorganic phosphate, and that re-energizes the myosin. So uh, then we have the relaxation phase, so the, the motor unit stimulation ends, acetylcholine is no longer being released, everything gets repolarized, meaning uh, getting uh, effectively more negative. Um, and then uh, calcium is pumped back into the SR, and then the, uh, it's no longer bound to uh, troponin. And then the tropomyosin goes back over the actin myosin binding site, and everything stops. So uh, there we go with that. Um, here is effectively all of that going on. I'm, I, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, talking about this. You can look at uh, all of the different numbers that I went over uh, in here. So one, two, three, right? And then one, two, three, four, five, six, all, all of this, all of this. If you're really interested in uh, being able to visually see what's going on in there, um, uh, yeah, yeah, all right. And uh, there, I already talked about that, so that's okay. Um, now, now. Um, beyond the excitation, contraction, and um, uh, um, uh, relaxation happening, we need to go into another thing, which is effectively the cross-bridge cycling. So what's going on here? And there's um, uh, quite a few aspects of this, and I'm going to break them down one at a time. So um, 
look at this right here, and I have them uh, pulled apart uh, one at a time, and we're just going to go through like all of these different phases. So, uh, and just to orientate yourself, here's the thin filament actin, mostly is what we're thinking about here. Uh, this is not illustrating the troponin or tropomyosin, any of that. And here is um, uh, the myosin. So. Uh, the neck and the head of the tropomyosin, and the head more or less being what is going to bind to the actin. So here, blue, that's ATP, whenever it's broke apart, that um, it looks kind of orangey or red and then almost like uh, quail's egg blue maybe, I'm not sure. Um, uh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter too much. All right, so here, uh, at effectively the initial stages of this, so rest in state, no force generation, an ATP binds to the myosin head, allowing it to release from actin. So that, that right there, uh, just kind of think about it as the ATP already being in this little catalytic pocket. So that's actually where the myosin ATPase is, and that's going to be breaking apart that ATP here in a little bit. So then here, ATP is hydrolyzed, causing the uh, cross bridge to cock meaning that it's broken down in, into its constituent parts, ADP and inorganic phosphate, right? So hopefully you can see it right there. It's uh, uh, somewhat, um, I don't know, it's bent over in a particular way, and now it's uh, up. Um, so then it being energized, um, it, uh, it will bind uh, to that actin, right? Um, so the cross bridge binds to the actin, and then once the inorganic phosphate is released, that causes a conformational or shape change in the myosin, uh, yielding uh, like the power stroke, and then the ADP is released. So the inorganic phosphate falls out first, that's going to cause the falling of it, and I think this makes sense because if you remember the inorganic phosphate, is a negative charge, so we just lost a negative charge there, and then that's going to cause a uh, change in shape of the totality of this mechanism. And then the ADP is going to fall out, then a new ATP can effectively be brought into it. So it essentially is going to just look like this if we look at it in two stages. So PI falls out, then the uh, ADP will fall out, then a new ATP will be brought into it. Um, okay, so that is effectively everything that's going on um, with uh, that. Now let's talk about uh, muscle fatigue. Uh, so in the neural chapter, we talked uh, just a little bit about muscle fatigue uh, being related to uh, the central governor central fatigue theory. And um, how I talked about that, that's a little bit more related to a uh, longer duration, more endurance type sports. Now, with this, we're going to talk just a little bit about some more peripheral factors. So meaning like in the muscle fuel utilization, things like that. Um, but whenever we talk about fatigue, there is uh, really two things that we're really even talking about. So. Uh, just meaning like a decline in muscle power output and, uh, uh, you know, like power is just work over time and, uh, you know, work is force times distance, right? So there's just a couple of things that can actually be uh, reduced. So an aspect of it or a slowdown or a reduction in velocity or speed. You know, like, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into scalar vector variables uh, here, but um, just understand it this way, um, that there's a, de a decrease in force or a decrease in velocity. Now, high-intensity exercise and uh, long-duration exercise actually seem like they have different causes in a way. So right here for high intensity exercise, the high amount of burning that an individual feels might be related, uh, related to the accumulation of metabolic uh, uh, like waste products or metabolites. So lactate, probably not that because that's actually taken up some hydrogen. Um, but the hydrogen overall, like whenever you're exercising, we actually get much more acidic within a muscle and we have a production of ADP and PI. 
um, uh, some uh, some people believe that the overproduction of the inorganic phosphate might be the main implication and why uh, we're actually not able to keep on contracting. Um, but here's another one that I've I've always kind of thought was interesting. So that hydrogen being an H plus, if you go back and look at the calcium ion being a uh, Ca2 plus, there have been at least a study or two uh, that indicate that at the troponin there is competition between the hydrogen and calcium. Uh, that uh, like if, if we have enough hydrogens, which you know the muscle is going to begin super acidic, uh, that um, we effectively won't be able to bind calcium to the troponin anymore. And I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, there's also kind of a Goldilocks zone of how like PFK or glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase or pyruvate kinase, all of these different enzymes, isocitrate dehydrogenase, whatever you want to think. Um, there's a Goldilocks zone for particular pHs that they work well at. And uh, whenever something gets too acidic, then certain enzymes stop working. Uh, that would be a, another idea. Um, also some free radical production, probably not so much of that. But like for high intensity exercise, uh, here are the main ones that I want you to know. Uh, accumulation of hydrogen ions or inorganic phosphates. Um, those seem to be kind of the main things going on. Now for longer duration exercise, um, we actually do have accumulation of free radicals, electrolyte imbalances, uh, meaning that if we uh, lose too much sodium or potassium or whatever from sweating, then having action potentials be propagated is actually really difficult if you don't have enough sodium, right? Um, uh, so some of those things could happen. But also in really long duration exercise, glycogen depletion. So if we run out of glycogen, um, and say a quadricep or a forearm or whatever, um, it's actually, uh, well, we just don't have uh, fuel on site to um, uh, keep the recycling or creation of ATP. So uh, th those are a couple of things going on there. Um, and here is just a, uh, uh, I don't know, I think a somewhat obvious um, uh, pictorial representation of muscle fatigue. You know, like we have a certain amount of force production and then all of a sudden we get tired and then, well, it goes down, right? So that's, um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that that's kind of cool. If, I'm, if it appears as though I'm jumping all over the place just a little bit. But um, uh, muscle cramps, I'm sure a lot of us have experienced them before. There are effectively two different theories behind this, and I'm not going to talk about this too much. Um, but uh, 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 Mike here, he, he's actually really interested uh, in this, and uh, I'm a little less so and, um, uh, because I, I basically never cramp. He cramps all the time. Um, but I want you to know that there's two different theories behind it. There's this electrolyte depletion model, meaning that if you get dehydrated, we alter the concentration of sodium or we lose sodium in sweat, that that might cause different spasms, different depolarizations, different alterations in how an action potential or muscle uh, contraction signal is actually sent. Um, so that's one theory uh, behind it. Now, most... Uh, like researchers these days do not believe that that theory is accurate. They would actually believe more in the neuromuscular fatigue theory. Um, so this being an abnormal spinal reflex uh, due to fatigue and uh, kind of alterations um, in say uh, efferent signaling just really, really due to fatigue. I, like I'm not going to talk about uh, that uh, much at all, but like really just either electrolytes or neuromuscular fatigue. And most researchers these days believe neuromuscular fatigue is kind of the business uh, going on there. So, uh, all right, so let's go and move on to um, uh, a lot of times people's favorite topic, muscle fiber types. Now, broadly, there are um, uh, two different uh, muscle fiber types, a skeletal muscle fiber types in humans. So broadly, slow twitch, uh, 
and broadly fast switch. And overall, there's two different flavors of fast switch. Type 2A, which is uh, a little bit slower than type 2X. So uh, we talked about this before with um, uh, um, like the type of like alpha motor neuron innervate in it. And that's something that I want you to like keep in mind is that the alpha motor neuron is really what uh, dictates more upstream what muscle fiber type that we're gonna have. But there's a few different ways how to slice this actually. Um, now, within this, there's somewhat of a spectrum on here. And uh, something that I want you to know is that we actually have hybrids of skeletal muscle fiber types. So meaning, um, like I'm, I'll, I'll show you like uh, with the uh, myosin ATPase that there can be adaptations to um, um, different myosins like along a sequence of different sarcomeres. But I really want you to think about this more as a spectrum that there almost isn't a really hard line that there is a particular slow twitch fiber um, this one is probably, I, uh, I see this very rarely, um, but a hybrid between uh, type 1 slow twitch and type 2A, the intermediate fast twitch. And over here, type 2A, uh, this one is probably a little bit more common, type 2A uh, intermixed with type 2X, and then lastly, uh, type 2X. Um, now, uh, one, one thing that we think about with color um, is there's typically more red in a type 1 and more white in a type 2X. So if you think about, I don't know, like uh, uh, dark meat versus light meat at like Thanksgiving or something, um, like uh, that, that's actually what's going on and it is really due to the pigment of myoglobin within it. So myoglobin being the, uh, what is it, the aspect of uh, a muscle that is really like transporting oxygen through it or a little bit uh, stored oxygen. So type one being much more oxidative and aerobic needs more myoglobin and type two X doesn't need as much because it's almost all anaerobic. Um, so here, something that I want you to get is that within like a sequence of sarcomeres that this is potentially how we could actually get a hybrid because uh, as I said before, the myosin ATPase is one way how to notate what type of muscle fiber type that we have. So here, this could happen, that like we have a particular flavor of actin, which we really only have one type. But uh, myosin, we pretty much only have one type of myosin. Um, but here, we have different types of this myosin ATPase. We could have a slow twitch here and an intermediate fast twitch here. So that is how we could have a intermediate um, uh, type one slash type two A uh, uh, muscle fiber type. So it's not as clear cut as how it's typically taught. Now there are different uh, uh, biochemical contractile uh, properties that um, I do want you to uh, be fairly aware of. And I think all of this makes sense if we just broadly think about type one as being endurance and type two being speed power. So if we think about uh, this, uh, oxidative capacity, um, meaning like the number of capillaries uh, surrounding it, the amount of mitochondria within a muscle, the amount of myoglobin, um, uh, you know, the storage of oxygen within a muscle. Um, a lot more of all of that in type 1, uh, type of myosin ATPase, uh, isoform. Uh, isoform, just, that just means a different type of that enzyme. Um, a slower speed of degradation of ATP for type 1, faster for type 2, you know, slow versus fast, right? I think that makes sense. Um, abundance of uh, contractile protein within a muscle fiber, so how much is actually there? Typically a little bit more in the uh, uh, fast twitch because higher force production and things. Um, we also have contractile properties, so maximum force production, so force per cross-sectional area. So uh, uh, CSA, meaning a given amount of area within a muscle. Fast twitch fibers typically produce a little bit more force 
slow twitch fibers given the same amount of area. Um, also speed of contraction. Uh, this is related to mice and ATPase activity, but speed of contraction, this is called the V max. Um, so that's, uh, that's typically how that's notated in textbooks. Um, maximum power output, which is, you know, just an interaction between speed and force production. So we have higher force output uh, faster, uh, within faster fibers and um, higher power outputs at higher percentages of uh, max force output. Um, also, muscle fiber efficiency. So lower amount of ATP used to generate force. What this means is how much ATP are we using for each cross bridge cycle. Um, and fast switch fibers are fairly inefficient, so they use a lot more ATP um, for the same amount of shortening length than um, uh, compared to uh, slow fibers. Um, so uh, here, let's get into this. How are skeletal muscle fibers typed? Um, here's a particular thing uh, that I'm going to actually show you a picture of it. Um, I, I think this is going to be kind of cool. Um, but uh, muscle biopsy. So there's actually, here, let's see if it's on the next slide, um, a Bergstrom needle. This right here. If you look at this, you would uh, take someone, say, their quadricep calf. Uh, I've had it done on my quadriceps quite a few times. Um, you would uh, give a local anesthetic lidocaine to deaden the outside of it. Uh, because we don't have pain receptors inside of skeletal muscles, so that's actually kind of a good thing. Um, you would do a pilot incision, meaning you would cut the skin open just a little bit, and you would stick this D part into the muscle, and this is a little guillotine right there. So uh, what that is, uh, like you would put uh, this B and C inside of D, and you would effectively uh, stick this into your quadricep, and then you would have suction pulled, meaning that skeletal muscle would be on the outside, and you would, through a suction process, bring it into the muscle, <laughs> or, uh, not into the muscle, and, uh, sorry, into um, uh, um, the, this little guillotine right here, and then you would chop it off, like off with her head, like Marie Antoinette, and then you would have about a grain of rice, uh, a grain of wild rice, uh, a fairly large piece of skeletal muscle. And it kind of looks something like this. So there's a puncture site. This is gastrocnemius. I've never done my calves. That always seemed kind of scary to me. Um, I've only ever done um, a vastus lateralis on the quadricep. There's not a lot of important things right there. So you could uh, kind of mess it up if, uh, if you wanted to. Um, so you would take that out um, uh, that way. Now, after you do that, you would do a lot of different, um, uh, uh, like, slicing and staining in order to um, see what type of ATPase is on there. Uh, so that would be something through something called gel electrophoresis. Uh, so what that is, overall, and like I'm giving a very simplistic uh, level of this, um, we have something called a uh, kill Dalton, and um, effectively meaning the weight of a particular um, uh, uh, like protein. So different proteins, so this is just mice, and, and it's called mice and heavy chain. We would stain for particular like levels of certain proteins. And then you could get a relative percentage of like, oh, this quadricep is mostly type 2A, a little bit type 2X, a little bit type 1. So that's kind of how that could work. Uh, you could look up gel electrophoresis uh, if you want to. I'm not really going to talk about it too much um, uh, or anymore. Uh, another thing would be immunohistochemical staining. So you would get a cross section of a muscle and uh, you would actually stain it with different antibodies that would fluoresce or like uh, shine under different types of lights. And that looks something like this. So say like blue would be highlighted in a particular uh, color, um, uh, green would be in another color, and then uh, black would be another color, uh, uh, indicating different things. And actually you can test if someone has muscular dystrophy from this because uh, red, uh, that's, um, 
that, that would be the color of muscle um, uh, of the protein dystrophin. Um, but uh, here's something uh, kind of cool. I like uh, this is actually my quad right here. Um, I believe it is my right quad. Uh, so if you look at it here, blue is slow twitch muscle fiber, and green is fast twitch muscle fiber. Um, actually, the uh, what what we did, um, I don't think that it differentiated between fast and uh, or the two different types of fast. So the type two A and type two X. Um, in fact, I've never really seen much uh, type two X in humans, um, but I, like I'm sure that there is. Uh, so interesting things going on here. Uh, if you look at that, 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 that that all of those are nuclei or um, uh, satellite cells more or less. So you can actually see how many nuclei I, I have in all of these and you can see by the red that I don't have muscular dystrophy so that's kind of cool. Um, uh, but here, uh, in any of you that uh, know me or know any of my athletic background, I'm much more of a fast twitch individual. Um, and here, if you actually count these up and it's actually a super arduous process, you would count up each one of these being a muscle cell, and you would count up how many, um, what is it, uh, greens there are for fast twitch, and how many blues there are for uh, slow twitch, and you could get a percentage of fast versus slow twitch. So my quad right here, it ended up being like something like 74% fast twitch. Um, so uh, I'm quick, but I, I get tired really quickly. So uh, there we go with that. All right. Um, so back into this, um, looking at uh, individual muscle fiber types, let's uh, talk about these in more or less this way. So type one, two other terms for it. Uh, so one being kind of speed and the other one being uh, metabolic name for it. So type one, also called slow twitch, meaning that you know their contractile properties are a little bit slow. Now for the metabolic aspect, slow oxidative, meaning that it leans more towards the oxidative than the glycolytic systems. Type 2A, this one uh, frequently called intermediate fibers. Now that's a bit of a misnomer because in terms of speed, it is much closer to type 2X than it is to type 1, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but here it's called FOG, F-O-G, fast oxidative glycolytic, meaning that it uh, can effectively do both. Um, but it, again, probably does lean a little bit more on the glycolytic, uh, type 2X, fast twitch fibers, and these are fast glycolytic, meaning that it leans almost entirely on uh, uh, glycolysis. Now here, um, a lot of different things uh, going on, and I do want you to be fairly aware of all of these, so characteristics of them. Number of mitochondria, um, it essentially goes from low to high, resistance to fatigue, um, type 2X, uh, type 2. Both of these fatigue much faster than slow twitch fibers. Predominant energy system, anaerobic combination, but mostly anaerobic and aerobic. ATPase activity, um, this one highest or fastest, um, lowest over here. VMAX efficiency, I, I think all of this should make sense. Um, uh, don't really pay much attention to specific tension. I'm not going to test you on that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's high and then moderate. Um, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, all right, so let's look at these in terms of maximum shortening velocity. So as I said here, 2A, it is closer to 2X than it is to, two, uh, to 1, I'm sorry. So uh, be mindful of that. Um, and then here, specific force, so effectively force production. Um, and then uh, maximum power. Uh, it being, uh, I, I, I think all of this makes sense uh, from all of that. So let's go ahead and just think about broadly fiber types and athletic performance. Um, so generally, um, non-athletes, most of us are about 50-50, um, and it actually is fairly specific to like different parts of your body, like um, some uh, fibers are just a little bit more slow twitch. Uh, some muscles are a little bit more slow twitch. Others are a little bit more fast twitch. And 
it seems like it might have something to do with how much we use them. So like postural muscles typically are taught as a little bit more slow twitch and muscles that you don't use very frequently are a little bit more fast twitch. So take something like your tricep. Uh, we don't use it very much, so it's a little bit more fast twitch typically is how people would think about it. But um, here, uh, let's, let's go ahead and think about this. Like power athletes, uh, like sprinters, throwers, weightlifters, so on and so forth, they typically have a slightly higher percentage of fast twitch fibers. Endurance athletes, a uh, slightly higher percentage of slow twitch muscle fibers. But fiber type is not the only variable that determines success in athletic events. Um, uh, and uh, part of the reason why I showed all of you like my 74 whatever percent uh, fast twitch uh, quads, I've still ran a lot of marathons and like I, I, I was actually pretty good at ultra marathons. So it, it doesn't really mean that um, uh, that you can't do other things. Now, granted, I was much better at lifting weights than I was at running. Uh, so, um, but I, I, I think you're picking up what I'm putting down there. Um, here, just a little bit percentages going on. Now, almost no one is 100% one thing or 100% another thing. Um, but uh, we just have various combinations here, like distance a little bit more slow, um, sprinters a little bit more fast, non-athletes about 50-50, uh, give or take. Um, now here, there is a little bit of a um, uh, uh, kind of interesting thing that I'm wanting us to know what's going on here. Fast twitch fibers, um, people with spinal injuries, it seems like once you stop innervating a muscle fiber, it seems to uh, shift or drift towards more fast twitch. Um, so that, that is a, relative, a relatively curious thing going on right there. It seems like if we have much of a shift in any given direction, that we will shift towards slow twitch fibers a little bit more. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and go on into uh, like types of muscle action. All right, so this, luckily, I've already talked about this in lab a little bit, so I'm going to go through it uh, a little bit quicker. Um, so we have isometric contractions. There's also an old term, isotonic contractions, and I want to correct this. It's no longer called isotonic. It's called dynamic constant external resistance, DCER. So just looking at what these terms mean, isometric, same distance, uh, or iso, meaning same, right? Uh, metric meaning meter or distance. So there is force production without shortening or lengthening in a sarcomere or a joint angle. Now dynamic constant external resistance. This is uh, uh, um, meaning uh, there is a shortening or lengthening of different uh, like muscles. So concentric, muscle shortens during force production. Eccentric, muscle produces force but lengthens. And um, uh, really eccentric exercise is probably the most associated with muscle fiber injury and soreness. Uh, so whenever you're doing a lot of eccentrics, we can tear up the Z-lines a lot, get a lot of Z-line streaming. Um, but uh, keep in mind like how this is going. Like if we look at a bicep and a tricep, um, we can be having a concentric contraction in the bicep and an eccentric contraction in the uh, tricep, and mostly that eccentric contraction would be attempting to protect the elbow joint uh, during that time. Um, now, uh, that would be considered uh, like uh, flexion, but we could have extension, meaning extending your arm, shortening of the tricep, lengthening of the bicep. Um, and I, I guess the reason that I'm pointing this out, don't think that uh, concentric is flexion and eccentric is extension because uh, whenever we're talking about concentric or eccentric, we're talking about what's happening to a sarcomere. You know, the Z lines in a sar sarcomere, um, concentric just means that they're getting closer together. Eccentric means they're getting farther apart. And flexion or extension is really more of a biomechanical term, meaning the joint angle is getting closer to zero for flexion or closer to 180 for extension. Um, or, I mean, we can have hyperextension too, but uh, 
I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, we also have Ice Kinetic. Uh, hopefully, everyone has enjoyed using our new Ice Kinetic machine, and hopefully, all of you remember what this uh, Ice Kinetic machine does. You know, it holds the speed uh, stable, so ISO. Uh, meaning same, kinetic, meaning speed or angular, you know, velocity or whatever. And uh, then it just measures your force production at different uh, uh, speeds uh, in different uh, places within the joint angle. So um, here uh, we, uh, oh, I guess I neglected to say that, um, that concentric and eccentric, um, uh, are frequently called dynamic contractions. Isometric is frequently called a static uh, contraction or muscle action. So uh, there, if, if you've been following along, I think all of that is relatively clear. Um, uh, here, again, shouldn't say isotonic because there's actually like more tension in the muscle right here, less tension right here. So this should be dynamic constant external resistance, moving this uh, weight throughout this elbow flexion movement. Um, all right, so uh, here let's talk just a little bit about um, speed of muscle action and relaxation and um, uh, force in some ways. Just, just a couple of things, not really too much um, that I want us to be aware of here. You can graphically uh, represent uh, muscle force and whenever there is a particular stimulus, then there is an increase in the force. Well, um, uh, uh, there's certain timelines for all of this, somewhat related to absolute and relative refractory periods. Um, and uh, we can have summation of numerous twitches, I, but uh, here, let's go back to what this muscle twitch means. So we have a contraction as a result of a single stimulus. So just like a little bit of acetylcholine uh, coming across, um, uh, stimulating a depolarization, and then we have a contraction. So there is a bit of a lag time, that's called a latent period. Um, then we have contraction, that's where tension is developed, and then we have relaxation after it. So the speed of shortening is uh, greater in fast twitch fibers uh, due to, you know, uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is released at a faster rate and um, um, higher ATPase activity. Uh, well, shoot, that was uh, one thing that I didn't even get into because I think it's a little too complicated. There's different types of sarcoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum ATPase and faster ones uh, faster muscle fibers have faster circas, um, but uh, I, I'm not going to expect you to know any of that um, in class. Uh, so here, here we have a, uh, a particular stimulus, a little bit of a lag time, a contraction, and relaxation. So that's effectively how uh, that works. Um, so we have this idea of an all or none principle. Um, so then how is it that we have like variations in force production. Like why don't we lift pencils as fast and as, and as hard as we lift bags of dog food? So here are three different things that we um, do to regulate muscle force. So first off, the type and number of motor units recruited. So more motor units, greater force, faster motor units, greater force. So whenever you're picking up a pencil, we only need the slow ones uh, and the small motor units and not very many uh, to pick it up. So uh, that that's kind of how we do that. Now whenever we uh, get bigger, um, pick up bigger things like bags of dog food, we will use uh, more motor units. Um, another one, initial muscle length. There is a uh, like length tension relationship where at different point, and I think this is uh, pretty obvious to any of you that have, I don't know, done bicep curls before. There's certain points within a bicep curl that the weight is much easier to do, and that has to do with the uh, like length tension relationship that, uh, I don't know, like about uh, a certain amount up it's really easy and it feels like you could curl anything, but at um, a lower part, it's kind of harder because there's not enough like actin, myosin, cross bridges actually generating force, right? So um, 
I, I'll show you a picture of that here in a little bit. Um, and lastly, nature of neural stimulation of motor units. So a lot of times this is called rate coding. Um, so we have summation of uh, numerous twitches, effectively sending numerous signals from uh, the alpha motor neuron to the muscle to contract. So hopefully that will uh, uh, make some sense. So uh, here, increase in force of contraction, increase in stimulus of strength. So each uh, one of these is a stimulus from a uh, alpha motor neuron to a skeletal muscle in order to uh, just say contract. So contract, 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 contract. So um, effectively there's a little bit of force here and by sending another signal there's a little bit more tension development and a little bit more tension development. And then once we have enough stimuli we reach a peak in tension development and that's actually called tetanus. Um, so uh, uh, there, there's that. Um, now this length tension relationship, all I really want you to know here is that there is a less than optimal length, meaning that really there's kind of crossover um, with the actins of the two different sides. Um, and this effectively means that we cannot generate a bunch of force um, because uh, like it's not at an optimal length basically. And whenever we're uh, uh, on the other end of it, there isn't even cross bridges touching, so the actin and myosin aren't even touching. So if they aren't touching, then we can't have power strokes and there isn't any force being developed. And there's really just basically an optimal level here that it's around 120% of rest in length. Now, whenever you just allow your arms or muscles or legs to hang, that's the resting length of a given sarcomere. And that's actually relatively close to where um, uh, the amount of tension or the optimal length tension relationship is. So uh, just looking at this graph, I think it uh, uh, more or less makes sense. Now uh, here, uh, going back to what I was saying just a couple of seconds ago, we have um, uh, simple twitches. So these are stimuli from the, uh, uh, from the alpha motor neuron, the nervous system. We have a twitch, a twitch, a twitch, and then this frequency of stimuli goes up. This is called rate coding. We have a summation of all of these, and then whenever we have the highest amount of stimuli, we get tetanus, meaning that is the highest amount of force that a muscle fiber can uh, generate and maintain uh, for all of that. So uh, hopefully all of that is uh, somewhat reasonable uh, to everyone in here. All right, so here's something that I enjoy talking about in uh, just about every class that I teach is the relationship between health and skeletal muscle mass and function. Um, uh, actually, a lot of research seems to indicate that amount of muscle mass isn't that indicative of mortality, meaning risk of death or disease, but uh, functionality of muscle actually is fairly indicative. So muscular strength and endurance are very important for all sorts of different things. Um, so the stronger an individual is or more endurance an individual is, the less likely they are to uh, first off get cancer um, or heart disease. But if they do get cancer or heart disease, the less likely it is to actually um, uh, kill them. Um, so uh, uh, there with that. Uh, but uh, with age and uh, like muscle mass, there is this term called sarcopenia, and uh, you, you can look at these different uh, terms here. And um, uh, sarcopenia, it's really just age-related muscle loss. Uh, uh, main thing that I want you to know is that it seems to selectively lose fast twitch fibers first for some reason. So strength uh, training, um, and I, I mean like strength training, like, uh, like five reps less, seems to be more and more important for older individuals to maintain their fast twitch fibers. Um, also like power, plyometric training, things like that uh, seem to be relatively important as well. Um, so uh, take with that what you will. Um, also, uh, this age-related muscle mass loss, uh, 
Uh, hopefully, all of you remember the AKT mTOR uh, P70SXK, uh, like uh, muscle hypertrophy pathway. One of the things that stimulates mTOR is leucine, um, right? One of the amino acids, right? Um, something very interesting. It typically takes around 20 grams of, you know, so-called high quality protein to maximally stimulate uh, protein synthesis in um, most individuals. Now, as individuals get older, there's actually something called anabolic resistance. And uh, this comes out of um, uh, McMaster University, uh, Dr. Stu Phillips, uh, like a bunch of really super intelligent people. Um, that it seems like about double that, about 40 grams of high quality protein is the minimum to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis in older individuals. So this so-called anabolic resistance, meaning that um, a given amount of protein does not stimulate protein synthesis as much as it did whenever they were younger. So as individuals get older, it seems to be more important to increase their protein intake and also to increase their, I don't know, like uh, higher threshold force output motor units, uh, basically lifting heavy weights. Um, um, so uh, there's that. Uh, uh, diabetes. Um, uh, is also associated with progressive loss of muscle mass. And part of that is due to, well, we store carbohydrates in our muscles. So if we lose muscle, then we don't store as much carbohydrates. So I, I do kind of believe that if we have enough muscle mass that it's virtually impossible to get type two diabetes. Now I could be proven wrong in that in, uh, in some cases, but um, just kind of presenting that in, in a way for maybe you to think about how, how I see it. Um, uh, cancer, um, uh, uh, in individuals with, uh, with cancer suffer cachexia or like, you know, rapid loss of just, well, tissue overall. Um, and um, uh, chemotherapy is just wreaks havoc on so many individuals. Um, so kind of an idea here is if an individual has more muscle mass, then they have a larger pool to pull from and it, they can lose muscle mass instead of losing, uh, say, like kidney mass or liver mass or heart mass or anything like that. So if you have, I don't know, a bigger cup to pull from, uh, to pull water out of, then that might be kind of a good thing to protect against uh, cancer um, in many ways, right? Uh, muscular dystrophy, there are uh, various uh, effects of this, and resistance training seems to make it to where um, individuals can adapt uh, better or persist longer with muscular dystrophy because uh, Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy, there is a uh, mutation in the dystrophin uh, protein. And whenever individuals lift weights, we can actually make a, another protein called eutrophin. And that uh, more or less will take the place of dystrophin. Um, uh, now granted, it's, it's probably to a smaller degree than how I just presented it. But it's um, uh, I interesting nonetheless, I think. All right, so now let's get into um, uh, force velocity relationships. And I think um, uh, since we've had a lab on this, hopefully this will uh, be relatively straightforward and make quite a bit of sense. Uh, so the idea is at an absolute force and speed of movement, uh, uh, is greater in muscle with higher percentages of fast twitch muscle fibers. So our force velocity curve, I'm going to want us to be able to like look at that and understand that relatively well. So the maximum velocity of shortening is the greatest at the lowest force, and that's typically called Vmax. Um, uh, and that's true for both fast and slow twitch fibers. So just here's the relationship here percent of maximum force and velocity of movement. So the lower the force, the faster that we move it, that there's basically an inversely proportional relationship here, and that the higher uh, forces, we move them slower. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And here, everyone's seen this. I, uh, like, I just like lions and caracals, and that's why I showed that. Um, now, um, force 
power relationships, there is somewhat of a difference between uh, slow twitch and fast twitch. So here I'm just going to read this to you. At any given velocity of movement, the power generated is greater in muscle with a higher percent of fast twitch fibers. So the peak power increases with the velocity up to movement speed of 200 and 300 degrees per second and um, uh, 2 to 300 now in um, in lab the highest that we actually measured were we actually did measure 300 degrees per second and we did 350 degrees per second because the machine didn't do 360 for some reason um, but effectively uh, this is what's going on here so velocity so this is angular velocity right like degrees per second and power output so work over time right um, it goes up a little bit and then effectively it will come down once we start going like way too fast, right? Um, so something here that I want us to understand. I want us to be able to map on where uh, eccentric, isometric, and concentric uh, contractions are actually happening. So follow me to right here, this one, that one where there is no lengthening or shortening, that is where an isometric contraction is happening. So there's, there's no power because there's no distance, right? Um, but there is a lot of force production. Now, the faster we are actually shortening, um, and here all of this is concentric, right? Uh, we're shortening faster, we're producing less force, and then there's a relationship there where we have our highest power output, typically around 40% of one repetition max, something like that. So like if we come down here, it work on right about there, yeah, 0.4 out of one, right? 0.4, something like that. Hopefully that, that makes sense. And that's on this secondary y-axis power. Now, all of that's concentric, right there's isometric. Over here, what's going on? That's an eccentric contraction, meaning that our velocity is going, uh, or uh, sarcomere lengths per second is actually going negative, so they're lengthening instead of contracting or shortening. So eccentric contractions, we actually can produce a lot more force uh, during that, and that's probably why we can generate a lot more muscle damage through eccentric contractions, because we're able to generate so much more force. Now there is a point where, well, we can't do any more. Um, and, uh, uh, effectively, it's just uh, relaxing. But hopefully that makes sense over here, eccentric, isometric, and then concentric, along with the solid force velocity relationship. Now, let's get into skeletal muscle adaptation. So, two main words that I want us to know. Hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So hypertrophy is an increase in cell size, and hyperplasia is an increase in cell number. Now, for uh, the longest, we have taught that hyper, uh, hyperplasia, increase in cell number, this doesn't really happen in humans. Um, there, there's this old classic example of like making cats press a lever, and the hyperplasia actually does happen in cats uh, for some reason. Another reason to be afraid of cats, lions and caracals, because they can do hyperplasia. Um, but that's the main difference here. There actually was, and... Uh, 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 here, I'm, I'm going to talk about this uh, hyperplasia. It probably isn't a thing in humans, but there was this study, effective long-term, uh, like, um, uh, effectively steroid use in skeletal muscles where they actually had really small muscle fibers, but they had so many more of them. So maybe supraphysiological levels, meaning, you know, way more than an individual would produce naturally, might actually activate hyperplasia. So that could be a thing, um, uh, not 100% not uh, sure though. But back to um, uh, muscle adaptation. Let's look at strength adaptation and hypertrophy adaptation first. So whenever an individual starts lifting weights, what is going on? So first off, uh, most training studies last somewhere between four, six, 12 weeks, something like that, because that's about you know how long uh, researchers like to work over the course of a semester. Um, that is where most of these training studies are. We actually don't see a lot of hypertrophy in most training studies. It actually takes a little while for that to happen. And it seems like 
at the onset of um, a strength training, the majority of strength gains is driven by neural adaptation. So meaning that we're better at synchronizing motor uh, unit recruitment, we're better at rate coding, all sorts of things like that. And that typically takes place over four to eight, potentially even 12 weeks, but four to eight weeks is what I want you to know uh, for our class. Now after that, then hypertrophy starts taking off a little bit and then uh, hypertrophy will drive the rest of uh, the strength adaptation. So um, initially we have neural adaptation for strength gains and then after about four to eight weeks, then strength gains are driven by hypertrophy. That's uh, the main thing that I want you to understand there. Now, strength uh, and neural adaptation. There are a couple of different things that I want you to be aware of. So we have something called intramuscular, intermuscular uh, disinhibition of inhibitory mechanisms, and specific hypertrophy. Now here is different um, intensity training zones. So like low intensity, high intensity, you know, and all of this being a percentage of one repetition max, right? So here are the main things that I want to point you towards. So intramuscular coordination, meaning within your bicep, what's happening? Like um, we have better synchronization, better recruitment, and better rate coding. And overall, we have more intramuscular coordination at higher intensities. So effectively, what's happening at higher intensities, the muscle that's contracting is more concerned with saving itself, basically, so it's going to get better at synchronization, recruitment, and rate coding. So uh, there. Now, intermuscular coordination, that means uh, the working together between different synergist agonist and antagonist muscles. So if we say, think about like a uh, squat, for example, um, the interplay between the quadriceps, the uh, glutes, and the hamstrings all of those working together. There is more intermuscular coordination adaptation at lower intensities. However, at uh, higher intensities, say like just the quad is going to have a lot better synchronization recruitment and rate coding development. Um, now this next one, uh, disinhibition of inhibitory mechanisms. Hopefully everyone recalls the GTO and the autogenic inhib inhibition. Uh, if not, go back and review that. Um, how we can get the most disinhibition of inhibitory mechanisms, meaning that taking your foot off the brake on like contraction is through the heavier or higher percentage of one repetition max. Um, so uh, that's kind of what's going on. And specific hypertrophy, there is some uh, disagreement about this, uh, but typically most hypertrophy uh, this is kind of the range of it. If anybody is aware of like three sets of 10 being the hypertrophy range, uh, 10 repetitions, that's typically what 60 to 80% for a lot of individuals. So uh, that's kind of what's going on there. So really just to go back, intramuscular, so within a particular muscle, greater intramuscular and neuronal adaptation at higher percentages of one or at max. Intermuscular between muscles, higher adaptation there with lower percentages of one repetition max, disinhibition of inhibitory mechanisms, which effectively just means turning down the Golgi tendon organ, more of that at higher percentages and specific hypertrophy at this kind of Goldilocks zone right there. Um, so, oh, already talked about that. Um, yeah, here, synchronization, which motor units uh, to recruit when, recruitment, um, more quickly recruiting the necessary motor units. So get into the faster ones uh, and the larger ones a little bit faster. Rate coding, just meaning the rapid frequency stimulation. If, if those terms don't quite make much sense to you, um, there we go with that. And here, uh, all right, here with intermuscular. Uh, you can go ahead and pause and read that if you want to. I'm not gonna um, read that to you. Uh, GTO, less sensitive to tension. All right, now, uh, more just terms for us to be aware of, um, stages of hypertrophy or types of hypertrophy. So 
uh, this is some cutting edge stuff that uh, uh, actually some of my friends are um, uh, doing research on right now and I find this to be super interesting. Uh, so whenever um, we are gaining muscle mass, there are two different ideas behind this. One being sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and one being myofibrillar hypertrophy. So the idea is that whenever we're gaining muscle mass, uh, it used to be thought that we could selectively pick which one happens or that we couldn't selectively pick which one happens, but I'm, I'm just going to define these for you. So sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, this is effectively um, uh, like, I don't know, muscles that look big that aren't very strong. Um, that pretty much the adaptation here is getting more glycogen in there, more glycolytic enzymes, all sorts of stuff like that. So lower percentages of one repetition max used to be thought to stimulate more sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So not really highest tension, but um, uh, getting better at using the glycolytic system. So sarcoplasm, that's where, you know, like glycolysis and all the glycogen is stored and all that type of stuff. Um, now myofibular, uh, fibrillar, a very difficult word for me to say, I'm sorry about that. Um, all of these myofibrils, so actin myosin, uh, the idea used to be that heavy weight lifting, like five sets of five, uh, low rep stuff, seems to disproportionately put on more um, of these uh, like myofibrils, so we get more actin myosin from lifting heavy weights. Now, there is some dispute about that right now. And in fact, what some of my friends are showing is that this is actually a staged process. That at the beginning of muscle hypertrophy, we actually expand the size of the muscle cell first, and then we start incorporating more myofibrils into it. So that's really what I want you to know, at least the current thinking on this, is that whenever you start lifting weights, you know, first the neural adaptations are happening first, but after eight weeks or so, then we'll start gaining some muscle mass. And uh, uh, then effectively the muscle's gonna grow, we're gonna have more glycogen and things in it. And then after a long enough period of time, then we'll start stacking on more actin, myosin, or myofibrils within the muscle. So, that's kind of the staged process. So sarcoplasmic, then uh, myofibrillar um, within that. All right. So uh, let's start thinking about um, some other types of adaptation uh, going on here. And all of this really is just circling back to AMPK, PGC1-alpha, AKT, mTOR, all of the things that we were talking about um, uh, prior uh, going on. So... Um, this, uh, this was a particularly interesting uh, study going on that was looking at like high intensity interval training and high intensity interval training seemed to do a little bit more um, uh, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and maybe a little bit of hypertrophy but like resistance training effectively only does hypertrophy uh, going on there. Um, so uh, this, I uh, kind of hopping around a little bit um, uh, with this. Not really too much that I care for you to know here, but the main things that we're talking about, uh, muscle growth for resistance training and for endurance training, more mitochondria. Um, uh, now here, let's talk about um, mitochondrial content, so adaptations to um, uh, endurance training some really interesting stuff here and I like I want you to pay attention to uh, these units of time so these are weeks these are weeks down here and my uh, like uh, mitochondrial content so how many mitochondria are within a particular muscle so at the beginning of training uh, we have a low amount right and then it goes up to approximately double the amount um, after around four to five weeks so if an individual trains really hard, that is about uh, relatively rapid. Uh, we can get a lot of mitochondria within a muscle in just four to five weeks. So if anybody ever wants to run a marathon, it probably would only take you around four to five weeks to actually build up the mitochondrial uh, or like powerhouse of the cell ability to actually do it. 
Um, now, there are other tissues that have to adapt, like your mind being one of the biggest ones. But four to five weeks, we can effectively top out mitochondrial content. And it will go up over time, but uh, not very much. But the main thing that I wanted to point out here is for mitochondrial content or endurance adaptation, we actually have a rapid detraining effect that if you take a single week off of endurance training, we have a massive loss in mitochondrial content. Um, so uh, endurance adaptation actually needs to be trained at least once a week, if not more frequently than that. Uh, now resistance training, we can actually maintain strength for uh, up to four, eight weeks, something like that, um, without ever training it. So what this actually seems to mean here is that uh, humans that we evolved to have like an expectant need for more endurance training, that uh, uh, if there was ever a time that we, well, um, that effectively our hunter-gatherer ancestors were doing what more or less resembled endurance training constantly because there is no retention of it without us doing it. Now, strength, we probably weren't like bench pressing rocks all the time, so uh, there seems to be a little bit more of a hanging on to of strength um, uh, over the course of numerous weeks than there is of endurance. And that's really the main thing that I'm wanting you to get here. Like, like big picture, uh, it only takes four to five weeks to get uh, essentially topped out on mitochondrial content, so endurance adaptation. And then one week off, we have a massive reduction in mitochondrial content. So uh, uh, if you want to maintain your endurance, you have to train it constantly. So uh, four to six weeks right here. Um, now, uh, here, go and read this. This is essentially what uh, I'm meaning by this. Up to four weeks, and stuff like that. I, I think I've actually seen a study where eight weeks, most of it was maintained. Um, uh, super interesting uh, there. Now, duration and intensity. Now, right here, uh, A to E are training intensity programs uh, from mild to uh, severe intensity. So the idea here, uh, this is endurance adaptation again, mitochondrial content, that whenever you are effectively walking, light jogging, jogging a little bit faster, faster, sprinting effectively, mitochondrial content will go up basically with respect to how intense someone uh, trains. So going out and uh, like having a light jog of three miles, four miles, five miles, really doesn't spur mitochondrial adaptation. What you really need to do to get the most mitochondrial adaptation would be effectively interval training. So 400 meter repeats, 800 meter repeats, 1,000 meter repeats, mile repeats, things like that. Um, uh, seem to actually get the most mitochondrial uh, adaptation within a skeletal muscle. So th there's kind of the idea behind that, like the highest intensity aerobic work, um, exercising well beyond your lactate threshold, seems to stimulate the most mitochondrial deposition within uh, skeletal muscle. Um, so high intensity, more adaptation. That's, gosh, I can't believe I do this. Um, so what's driving adaptation? Um, for uh, uh, really just about everything. So skeletal muscle uh, uh, gains in size and also um, endurance gains in uh, mitochondria. So volume seems to be, at least right now, a lot of researchers are saying this, that volume is the primary driver behind adaptation. Um, over intensity, like the, there's always a volume versus intensity debate, and um, here are some of my biases. I lean more towards intensity, um, but a lot of the research seems to indicate that volume is really what is driving a lot of adaptation. Um, now, what volume means for lifting weights, it's sets times reps times weight. For endurance, it's sets times speed times duration. That's what volume is effectively. Um, so uh, here, uh, both of these, um, uh, which one of these would make your muscles grow more? 
um, if you do three sets of 10 with 100 reps or 10 sets of three with 150 reps. So effectively, the sets times reps, that's, well, 30 reps. Sets times reps, that's 30 reps. So if we have a higher weight on here, that means that the volume is going to be a little bit higher. Uh, so 3,000 volume and then uh, 4,500 volume. So probably this lower one would stimulate more volume. Now the problem is, if anyone in here has ever done 10 sets of three, it takes forever compared to three sets of 10. So uh, that would be uh, kind of a similar thing. So uh, like uh, this one right here, one set of running six miles per hour for 30 minutes, or five sets of running 11 miles per hour for 90 seconds. Um, uh, 7.5 minute total running. Um, uh, uh, probably that one would generate a little bit more adaptation, but um, uh, just something to think about that volume being somewhat of a driver, right? So this really applies to everything. We need a particular amount of volume for each one of these motor units or muscle types in order to produce uh, like adaptation. So the amount of volume that you do in the PC system, the amount of volume that you do in the glycolytic system or the aerobic system uh, will dictate the adaptation. So generally type 2 fibers need less volume to adapt and type 1 fibers need a lot more volume to adapt. So there's just something there. Like, um, uh, uh, like here just in terms of like motor unit recruitment and force like tying your shoes we basically need no motor units to do this, and um, uh, really right here, I'm just, well, I'm, I'm obviously trying to be funny, and it's not going to work, but that's okay. That's okay. Like, I'm trying to get through this. Um, now, 5K running, we get somewhere around there. We might be getting some uh, type 2 fibers, but not very many. So there's 5K running. is essentially going to have no adaptation in any type 2 fibers. Um, uh, 400 meter uh, running. Uh, more, but it's not the highest threshold. Uh, 10 RM lifting, more, but it's not the highest threshold. Um, here, one to three RM lifting plus running. Now that's going to get everything. Just the problem is we won't actually adapt very much in our type one fibers because we're not accruing enough volume in them. Um, uh, here, I was gonna talk about some fiber type shifts. Um, so it actually is a bit contentious if fiber types actually do shift. And the majority of research is, well, I mean, it's truthfully, it's all over the place at the moment. Um, uh, there's this guy in California named Andy Gallopin or Gallopin. Uh, he's actually doing a lot of research with this right now. Um, uh, here, like I'll just uh, summate um, what my current understanding of this is. It seems like the shifts are predominantly between type 2A and type 2X, that like the more training we do, we shift from type 2X to type 2A. We do more bed rest. We have a little bit more of a shift from type 2A to type 2X. And it seems like um, type 1 muscle fibers seem to stay about the same constantly. And uh, right here, I, it's hard for me to believe that that happens too much, but it, uh, it probably does. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, and lastly, I just wanted to look at this one study really quick from a guy named Brad Schoenfeld. Um, uh, numerous names on there if anybody pays attention to uh, too much stuff on YouTube, like how I do. Um, uh, so here was a question in this particular study of what is the best for muscle growth. So uh, three sets of 10 versus seven sets of three. And they tried to equate um, uh, volume with it so by having the weights. So 30 reps versus 21 reps overall. Um, uh, bicep thickness, uh, it seemed like both of these set rep schemes are about the same for muscle growth, um, but um, the higher one is a little bit better for strength adaptation, um, uh, and the higher one meaning higher sets, lower reps, higher weight, uh, seems to be a little bit better for um, strength adaptation. And I think all of this makes sense. So uh, here's kind of the take home behind a lot of this for those of you who like to train or whatever. Um, as long as volume is similar, higher loads produce similar hypertrophy, but greater strength. 
However, it is a little bit less time efficient, so it requires more rest time. Uh, so if you're like me and you have all day to lift weights, well, that's okay. Um, but if you're on somewhat of an abbreviated schedule, three sets of 10 is actually pretty good. Uh, so that's really all I'm gonna say about any of the rest of this. Um, uh, thanks for listening to this and uh, 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 go back and listen to this a couple of times. Make sure to read the textbook and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture.